on behalf of the governing board of the International Science Council, it's a pleasure to bring a message of good wishes for the 2021 Congress of the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Science. The International Science Council is a global NGO uniting over 200 unions, among which the IUAES, National Science Academies and Regional Science Bodies, from both the natural and social science, with the vision to advance science as a global public good. The IEC collaborates across the whole spectrum of the science with the mission of being a global voice for science. Together with the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, the IEC leads the United Nations Scientific and Technological Community Major Group, securing a mandate for science at the United Nations and integrating science in major global policy process. The International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Science is currently well represented with the IEC governance through the engagement of Virginia Domingues in the work of the IEC Committee for Finance. At the recent IEC General Assembly held last month, the IEC membership adopted a new action plan for the period 2022-2024 entitled Science and Society in Transition, a document setting the practical framework for the next three years. The action plan defines priority issues based on analysis of global needs for scientific understanding, scientific advance that have global implications and the need for science systems to continually evolve in ways that benefit science and the global public good. Among other, the IUAES might be particularly interested in the priority theme, systemic risks and global emergencies, under which the IEC plans to develop new globally coordinated action on global emergencies, including projects on hazards definition and classification, and the development and implementation of a global risk research agenda for the 2030, in collaboration with the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. I would like to also draw your attention to another priority project, meaning the IAC Rethinking Human Development, a partnership with the United Nations Development Program, which aims to shape a new global discourse and indicators of human development that underpin global sustainability, research, policy, and practice. A distinctive role of the International Science Council is to draw on the skills, knowledge, and contribution of its membership so that it can project the voice of science on major issues of the day into the international arena. The active participation of the International Union 
of anthropological and ethnological science is crucial for the implementation of our many projects and of great value to the Council. And we look forward to our continued and strengthened collaboration in the frame of the 2022-2024 action plan and beyond. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words and let's look forward to inspiring discussions with plenty of novelty and excitement during the 2021 IUAES Congress. Very well. So we can start with the homage. We are all ready. Victoria wants to say something. My microphone. Yeah, your microphone, please. Good afternoon. I hope you are all enjoying this Congress. We received many papers from members of different countries of the world in order to comment and discuss the relevant items of the global crisis and the importance of anthropology to understand our world. You are all welcome, especially Professor Juji Koizumi, Susana Guber, Gustavo Lins Ribeiro, Carmen Bueno, who are in this event. And thank you very much for your past participation. You are welcome. <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. So, well, now, now we should start with the homage. And uh, I have to tell you that I'm deeply, deeply honored to be here in this event that the IUAES gives to Gustavo Lins Ribeiro, the first Latin American anthropologist, and in fact, as I understand, the first anthropologist outside the American academia to receive the Franz Boas Award for Exemplary Service to Anthropology by the American Anthropological Association. Gustavo Luis Rivero is actually professor of the Department of Cultural Studies at the Autonomous Metropolitan University in Lerma, Mexico, and national researcher level three of the Mexican National Council of Science and Technology. He's also professor emeritus of the Uni Universi University of Brasilia. He has been visiting professor in many countries, Argentina, Colombia, France, South Africa, and the United States. His fields of research includes topics such as development, international migration, internet, globalization, transnationalism, and world anthropologies. He has written and edited 23 books, and more than 170 articles and chapters in seven languages and on the topics mentioned before. He has been a member of the Advisory Council of the Werner Grimm Foundation for Anthropological Research, President of the Brazilian Association of Anthropology, and of the Brazilian Association of Research and Graduate Programs in the Social Sciences. He's the founder and first chair of the World Council of Anthropology, Anthropological Association and vice president of the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. And today he is its honorary member. Gustavo's conference today is titled Anthropologist in Movement, Exile and Migration in the Making of Anthropology. Please, Gustavo, I, could you start your conference? Thank you, uh, Carmen. It, it, it's, it's impossible to start the conference without saying that I'm, I'm deeply moved by this uh, homage 
the IUAS is paying me in view of the fact I was distinguished with the 2021 France Boas Award for Exemplary Service to Anthropology by the American Anthropological Association. I'm very proud of this award, but I'm also proud to be an honorary member of the IUAS since 2018. I'm particularly thankful to my friends and colleagues, Carmen Bueno, who organized this event, to Rosana Guber, with whom I share not only a long history of anthropological dialogues, but, but also the love uh, for Buenos Aires. And to Junji Koizumi, the president of the IUAS and a tireless promoter of world anthropologies. I'm also very glad that this all happens in a global Congress that is being organized in Merida, Mexico, where I currently work and was so welcomed by my colleagues. I thank them all and all the organizers of this Congress by thanking Victoria Chenot, without whose work and leadership, the Congress wouldn't have happened. To thank, we all learned with Marcel Moos, is to establish relationships of reciprocity and indebtedness as the word obrigado, obligated. Obrigado is thank you in, in Portuguese, clearly indicates. This thankfulness is all the more intense because it is a response to the gratitude I received from countless professors, colleagues, students, and staff in Brazil, Mexico, in the US, and the many places I have been to work for a better, committed, and more plural anthropology. You have made me who I am. This acknowledgement is not only mine, it's ours. Let's move on towards our utopias to make the world a better place through the spread of ever more sophisticated and egalitarian anthropological knowledges. So now I pass to read uh, the uh, conference that, as Carmen said, it's called Anthropologists in Movement, Migration and Exile in the Making of Anthropology. I dedicate this conference to all refugees and exiles who are suffering from violence and discrimination at this very moment. One of my purposes in this conference is to call the attention to the need for historical research on migration and exile in the making of anthropology. I will thus try to outline a few trends in what is a much wider field of inquiry that the contents of which would vary according to a researcher's trajectory and locus of enunciation. After all, the presence of foreign colleagues is a common characteristic of anthropology departments throughout the world. This is also true of other disciplines. If this presentation were made by an anthropologist based in Asia, for instance, she certainly would trace different agents, agencies, connections, and networks. In what follows, I will first focus on one of the most prominent anthropologists. Claude Lévi-Strauss, in order to provide a common ground shared by most of all and to make my arguments easier to follow. My take on this subject is also based on my research on the international importance of Mexican anthropology. Mexico is not only home to one of the largest anthropological communities in the world, but has also played in different ways a central role in the development of anthropological thought. Regarding the Mexican scenario, I will concentrate on Angel Palermo's trajectory, anthropologists in movement. It's not an exaggeration to say that traveling and distance are ingrained in the discipline's methodology and ethos. More importantly, a reasonable quantity of anthropologists are migrants or first generation of migrant families. Others are or were exiles. The list of migrant anthropologists is long, 
and I'm convinced each one of us would add several different names to it if we were to make the interesting exercise of mapping roots of anthropology's global dissemination structured by, by migration and exile. To explore the trajectories and impacts of all these migrant anthropologists in the epistemic communities they have worked is a huge task, and I obviously cannot do it now. Also, bear in mind, this is far from being a biographic exercise on one or two paradigmatic authors. Rather, I will strategically pinpoint moments and facts essential to my argument. I will thus start with Claude Lévi-Strauss, who was born in 1908 and died in 2009, whose experiences as a migrant and an exile were crucial for the development of his highly influential career and for the establishment of international connections. What follows is based on Lévi-Strauss biography by Denis Bertollet. Claude Lévi-Strauss was born in an artistic Jewish family in 1908. In 1931, he was admitted as an agrégé in philosophy at the Sorbonne. In the following two years, he was attracted to ethnology, a nascent discipline in France. Inspired by the example of Jacques Soustel, another agrégé in philosophy who had gone to Mexico to practice ethnology, he moves to Brazil in 1935 as a member of the so-called Mission Française, a French mission that played a major role in the founding of the Faculty of Philosophy and Letters of the University of Sao Paulo. The trip to Brazil was immortalized in his highly praised book, Tristropic, Sad Tropics, first published in France in 1955. Moving to Sao Paulo was an important step in the beginning of Levi-Strauss' career as a university professor and an opportunity to further develop his ethnological interests and knowledge that at that point were exclusively based on a few readings. In France, ethnology was not taught at universities and more importantly, the Brazilian experience gave him the chance to do field research with indigenous peoples such as the Bororo and the Nambiquara. He knew, says Bertolet, the profession is not learned by reading books, but by, by going into the field. In an interview to Didier Eribon, Lévi-Strauss would say of his first field work in Brazil, and this is Lévi-Strauss uh, speaking, I was in a state of intense intellectual excitement. The publication in 1935 in France of an article on the social organization of the Bororo put Lévi-Strauss on the ethnological map of his country. Lévi-Strauss was affiliated with the University of Sao Paulo's sociology department until 1938 and returned to France in early 1939. A couple of years later, in 1941, fleeing the Nazi threat, he takes another boat, this time to exile. Invited by Robert Lowy and Alfred Metro, he arrives in New York in May 1941 to join the university in exile in the New School for Social Research. Since 1933, the university in exile shattered a great number of scholars, many were Germans, who were persecuted by the Nazi regime. Inspired by the university in exile and following the lead of Gustave Cohen, a group of which Lévi-Strauss was a member, created in 1942 the École Libre des Autres Études. This free school was financed by France Libre, founded by de Gaulle in exile in London. Free France, after the French capitulation. It was strongly nationalist and had several conflicts over the prevailing German influence within the New School for Social Research. Claude Lévi-Strauss, who never thought of permanently settling down in the United States, was fascinated by New York 
and profited from the city's cosmopolitan atmosphere, libraries and museums, especially the American Museum of Natural History. He would later attribute his knowledge of ethnology to the long hours he studied in the New York Public Library. He also took advantage of the accumulated ethnographic material existing in the city and further developed his clear interest in American anthropology. Exile was a rich and intense period in which levi established or consolidated contacts with major scholars such as Alfred Creda, Alfred Metro, Franz Boas, George Gilvich, Jacques Maritain, Ralph Linton, Robert Lowy, Ruth Benedict, and a few celebrated surrealists like André Breton, Marcel Duchamp, and Max Ernst, who enriched his aesthetic taste. The Vistos met with Boas several times and adhered to his universalist anthropological vision, but nothing compares to the influence of Roman Jacobson, the Russian linguist, another refugee scholar. They met at the Col Libre of the Free School in New York, where in 1942, they started to follow each other's courses. This was the beginning of a 40 year long friendship. Livistros would later say he was a disciple of Jacobson and that, quote unquote, Jacobson revealed to me the existence of a doctrinal corpus already constituted within a discipline that I had never practiced, linguistics. To me, this was an illumination, end of the quotation. The discovery of structural linguistics gave him a framework to think, a program to follow, and a system to create. Following Jacobson's suggestion, he starts to write the elementary structures of kingship in 1943. With the end of the war in Europe, levi stays in the US until the fall of 1944 and finally arrives in Paris in the first days of 1945. A few months later, before the end of springtime, he went back to New York, this time as Conseiller Culturel, cultural counselor attached to the French embassy in the US, but this office was in New York City. The winds had changed. He takes advantage of this new period to write his thesis close to the city's great libraries and to make new connections with several famous French intellectuals who went to visit New York after the war. Among them were Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Albert Camus, and several high-level officials of France's cultural and educational life. His biographer, Denis Bertollet, writes, he is ambitious. He knows there is no career without networking. End of the quotation. In 1946, Le was an intermediary and one of the participants in the negotiations between French authorities and the Rockefeller Foundation that was interested in financing the strengthening of French social sciences. In 1947, the foundation agrees to the creation of the École Pratique des Autres Études, the practical school of higher, higher, studies, uh, by the, higher studies. By the end of 1947, the Vistors returns to Paris. In this New York period, he advanced, says Bertollet, his insertion in the subtle mechanics of the French prestigious schools. In 13 years, Claude de Vistros had passed less than three years in France. His career highly benefited from his migration to Sao Paulo in the 1930s and from his experience in New York in the 1940s. Now I turn to exiles in Mexico. Spanish, German, and Argentinian exiles were important to the shaping of Mexican anthropology. The Spanish and German cases are directly related to the turbulent 
1930s and 40s in Europe. While the Argentinian exile was caused by the violent military dictatorship that ruled the country between 1976 and 1983, a period when 35,000 people disappeared for political reasons. Due to time constraints, I will briefly mention the most important and influential exile, that of the Spanish colleagues fleeing the end of their country's civil war in 1939. Pedro Armillas, Pedro Bosch, Pedro Carrasco, Juan Comas, Claudio Esteva, Santiago Genovese, Jose Luis Lorenzo, and Angel Palermo are some of the outstanding anthropologists born in Spain who greatly contributed to the making of Mexican anthropology. Once again, I chose to briefly explore the career of an emblematic figure, Angel Palermo, for the complexity of his trajectory in works. Besides, similarly to Levi Strauss, Palermo also migrated to the United States to Washington, D.C. Angel Palam, 1970, was born in 1970, sorry, in 1917 in Ibiza, in Spain, and died in Mexico City in 1980. In his youth, he became an anarchist militant and fought the Spanish Civil War, uh, the war that went on between 1936 and 1939. After the Republican defeat, he went as a political exile to Mexico. The reading of Carl Ruth Fogel and Gordon Child prompted his interest in pre-Hispanic Mesoamerica and led him in 1945 to study at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, and later in 1948 to do anthropology in the National School of Anthropology and History, ENA. Where, far, where war refugees such as Paul Kishhoff, Jacques Sustel, and Paul Hebe were teaching. In fact, the war had favored the interests of U.S. anthropologists in Latin America, especially in Mexico. Several of them, Saul Tanks, Robert Redfield, Charles Foster, Stanley Newman, Isabel Kelly, for instance, lectured at the National School of anthropology and history. But after completing his degree in 1951, Palam could not find a job in Mexico. According to Susanna Glantz, and this is a quotation from uh, her piece, the reaction to a prolonged pres presence of foreigners, the feeling of maturity that Mexican professionals were beginning to experience, and most of all, the competition caused by the economic crisis of the 1950s that tracked the labor market gave rise to xenophobia against the Spaniards too. This phenomenon caused Palam and other foreign researchers to leave the country. It was Juan Comas, another fellow uh, exile from Spain, uh, who told Palam about a position as assistant editor at the Pan American Union, currently the Organization of American States. He moved to Washington, D.C. in 1952, where he worked at the institution's social science and developed editorial projects. For instance, the journal Ciencias Sociales, Social Sciences, that got to publish 10 to 12,000 12, copies. He also published translations, translations of handbooks and a series of monographs with articles by authors such as Julian Stewart, Donald Collier, Carl Wittfogel, and Ralph Bills. This job allowed him to move in his own words freely in the American academic milieu and to increase his relationships with unimportant intellectual elite. He would become good friends with Eric Wolf, Sidney Mintz, John Mora, and William Sanders. In 1966, Palam returned to Mexico, where in 1967, he started to teach at the ENA, the Escuela Nacional de Antropología e Historia, National School of Anthropology and History. In 1969, in the aftermath 
of the tragic 1968 repression of the student movement in Mexico City, Palermo resigned from his temporary position after two professors, Guillermo Bonfil and Arturo Varman, were summarily dropped from the National School of Anthropology and History, wrote uh, Eric Wolf in 1981. He was then, Palermo was then invited to work at the Ibero-Americana University, a Catholic university, where he was to lead the development of a new department of anthropology and stayed until his death in 1980. Uh, Palermo was an institution builder. In 1973, he was among the founders of a major research center, the Center of Research and Higher Studies in Social Anthropology, Ciesas, uh, Ciesas in Spanish, and in 1975 of the Department of Anthropology of the Autonomous Metropolitan University. Today, these are leading scholarly centers in Mexico. Furthermore, Palermo wrote several books on irrigation, the history of ethnology, colonial Mexico, and on anthropology and Marxism. Palermo died in 1980. His who has influenced many American anthropologists and had a considerable impact in Spanish anthropology. However, the repercussions of his work on several American anthropologists are not duly recognized. Final comments on migration and exile in the making of anthropology. Not only theories and texts travel, intellectuals do too. In an essay on the international circulation of ideas, Pierre Boudier states that, this is Boudier uh, writing, the meaning and function of a foreign work are determined at least as much by the field of reception as by, as by the field of origin and of deportation. The same could be said of the insertion of intellectuals in foreign academic fields with the important difference that in this case, they are persons, they are obviously persons and not texts. They are persons who perceive and are perceived in multiple ways and intervene differently in their new environments and networks of knowledge production. I want to advance the notion of international intellectual broker, whose works are central to cross fertilization and epistemological diffusion and innovation. I am inspired by Eric Wolf's definition of brokers, people who act between what I call different levels of the agency. In this presentation, they act between the national, international, and transnational levels of agency. They, these people, derive their importance and power from their positions as intermediaries. I'm also following Guillermo de la Peña, who defined intellectual brokers as individuals who, starts the quotation of a text by de la Peña, uh, intellectual brokers as individuals who make foreign scientific ideas and research methods intelligible and acceptable to another intellectual community. It's not a mere translation task, but an innovative practice. This, at the same time, the innovation is not simply imitative of what is foreign. It achieves a new synthesis, end of De La Pena's quotation. In addition to carrying information, theories, methodologies, data, comparisons, political stance, international intellectual brokers are producers of academic knowledge. They can reformulate, update information, construct new interpretations, theories, and concepts as a consequence of the new experiences and exchanges lived in the condition of migrant or exile. Furthermore, international intellectual brokers have different epistemological stances. They often have to think, speak, and write in another language and to live between the familiar and the exotic. They live as George Zimmel, has taught as apropos of the foreign stranger in general, in a special position 
of nearness and remoteness of, in Zimmel's terms, objectivity of strangeness of insertion and exclusion of confessor. His position in the group, says Zeno, is determined essentially by the fact that he has not belonged to it from the beginning, that he imports qualities to it which do not and cannot stem from the group itself. End of Zeno's quotation. Robert Merton, inspired by Max Weber, also posits the existence of theoretical reasons to suppose that the fossae of research adopted by insiders and outsiders, and perhaps their categories of analysis as well, will tend to differ. End of Merton's uh, quotation. Additionally, Merton draws attention to the fact that the outsider can more easily escape ethnocentrism. Edward Said, in his beautiful essay on exile, goes in the same direction. He mentions a constant estrangement and an originality of vision that comes from the two or more worlds that the exile knows and that confers on him a conscience of simultaneous dimensions. All this immediately bears on anthropology and on ethnography as a method. Peter Redfield and Sylvia Tomaskova, in their essay comparing ethnography to exile, pointed out to the importance of culture shock to ethnographers and exile. They also contemplated Malinovsky's double displacement and aptly perceived that, quote unquote, the introduction of Argonauts recasts Malinovsky's exile transforming the structures of quasi-internment as a foreign national during wartime into a method. Exiles, depending on their quantity and quality, may also have great sociological consequences for the host community. Arthur J. Vidish, writing on the experience of the university in exile found in the New York, I already commented uh, it was uh, based in uh, the New School for Social Research. The university in the exile founded in New York in the 1930s to shelter scholars fleeing the Nazi threat points out that the exiled European in intellectuals, quotation, brought to the United States a fully developed awareness of what would only later be recognized as the central problems of the 20th century civilization. Almost immediately, they initiated a unique dialogue between continental and American thought. End of the quotation. All this shows the importance of the presence of foreign intellectuals for the enhancing of cross fertilization and consequently for the increasing of the heuristic richness of the host ep epistemic community. Edward Said posits this question in even wider terms. To him, quote, unquote, modern Western culture is in large part the work of exiles, immigrants, and refugees. End of reputation. He adds that in the United States, again, it's uh, Said speaking, academic, intellectual, and aesthetic thought is what it is today because of refugees from fascism communism and other regimes given to the oppression and expulsion of dissidents, end of the quotation. But international migrant intellectuals, especially exiled foreign researchers, can also face difficult circumstances. Their roles as sociological, political, and cultural mirrors of local elites frequently turn them into victims of xenophobia. In the United States, for example, the exodus of German university professors fleeing the rise of Nazism met with pre-existing anti-Semitism in society and in the academic milieu, as well as with the suspicion of younger professors that the refugees had come to take their places. Later in the 1950s in Mexico, as we saw, 
xenophobia prevented uh, Angel Palermo, a refugee from the Spanish Civil War, from finding a job in Mexico. Uh, as we saw, this situation forced him to migrate to the United States for many years. There is no doubt that the most dramatic scenario of the migratory experience is exile, and the intellectuals are not really the worst example, uh, examples of refugees. Ultimately, exile is not something you choose. It's an escape from intolerable persecution, prison or death. Exile thus cannot be romanticized. Despite the fact, the fact that for intellectuals, exile may represent an increase in visibility, as Redfield and Thomas Colbert say, and the new dialectic, dialectic between pro proximity and distance may constitute an epistemological advantage, exile remains a difficult experience, one where gratitude for being welcomed in the new country can be mixed with the feeling of discrimination on the streets or at work. There is also, as Said noted, the perilous territory, territory of not belonging, the feeling of discontinuity, of always being an eccentric homeless who insists on his difference of living with an irreparable anguish or with nostalgia for the lost land. Exiles and migrants clearly indicate that no anthropology, whether mixed with nation building ideologies or supposedly of pure academic scope, is confined to the borders of a nation state. This does not mean that national contexts contexts are irrelevant to thinking about the discipline. As travelers and intellectuals observing and interpreting the diversity of the world, anthropologists must be thought in relation to global practices and flows of people, themselves and their colleagues, objects, books, texts, artifacts of material culture and information, oral, written, visual, and its reception and dissemination in national, regional, and local contexts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gustavo, for this very interesting journey through the experiences, connections, even for some forced migration that stimulated and uh, the circulation of ideas among our common ancestors. And that is so important for the making of anthropologi anthropological thinking. Thank you again. Now it's time for Junji Ko Koizumi to say some words on behalf of this homage. Junji Koizumi is a professor emeritus and former executive vice president of Osaka University an auditor on the National Institutes for the Humanities of Japan. Since 2018, until now, he's president of the IUAES and co-chair of the World Anthropological Union. Also, he was president of the Japanese Society of Cultural Anthropology. He earned his doc doctorate degree in anthropology at Stanford University and was invited as member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He has carried out field work in the rural areas of Guatemala and is specialized in interpretive, interpretive theories, globalization, transnationality, and international cooperation. He has published books and articles in Japanese, English, and Spanish, and led interdisciplinary research projects, including a research based for conflict studies in the humanities and dynamics of cultures and systems in the Pacific Rim. He has served in a number of councils and committees, both in the national government and private organizations. Please, Dr. Koizumi, uh, we are ready to hear you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Carmen. Gustavo, Victoria, Rosana, colleagues, 
friends. I am extremely happy and feel honored to be invited here and to be able to pay homage to Professor Gustavo Linz Hibero, my best friend, uh, at this tribute ceremony for him. Gustavo was awarded France Board's Award for Exemplary Service to Anthropology by the American Anthropological Association, the AAA. Gustavo deserves the award. Before his working, writing, and in practice, the landscape of global anthropology in the 1990s was very different. From the one, from the one at present, it's very different. It was very different. I'd like to call this a sea change. Before this change, I know only about American and British anthropology, together with a bit of other European anthropology and a small bit of Mexican anthropology because I studied at INA, Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, as an undergraduate student. Japanese anthropology previously was invisible in the world and therefore non-existent because of a large number, well, despite of, so it was non-existent despite of a large number of anthropologists there, second only to the United States. In 2004, JASCA, the Japanese Society of Cultural Anthropology, to which I belonged, received a letter from Brazil. It was an invitation extended by Gustavo, who planned to hold an international conference supported by the Wenogren Foundation. The president of national and international anthropological association of the world were invited to this conference. The JASCA executive board met and deliberated this invitation and decided to dispatch me as a representative from Japan because I was serving as the chair of the JASCA committee for international relations at that time. This was famous Recife conference of June 2004, which gave birth to WCAA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations. Gustavo's title of this conference was World Anthropologies, Strengthening the International Organizations and Effectiveness of the Profession, somewhat echoing the description of the France Board's Award, which is presented for extraordinary achievements that have well served the anthropological profession. Traveling from Japan halfway around the globe to Recife at the exact opposite of the planet, I met Gustavo for the first time, who was already involved in the World Anthropology Movement through one World Anthropology Network, or RAM, Red de Antropologías del Mundo. 14 presidents of national and international anthropological associations around the world had been invited, and I was the only one who was not a president at that moment. Then I was not aware that we were going to create an international organization like WCAA, though I was prepared to make a presentation about JASCA and anthropology in Japan. Intensive discussion continued for a few days in beautiful Recife. As a result, the founding agreement on WCAA was drafted and signed by the attending presidents to be ratified by each of 40 participating associations. 
and the foundation of WCA was announced as biennial meeting of ABA, the Brazilian Anthropology Association. WCA was thus born, and it was all envisioned, planned, implemented, and turned into reality by Gustavo with his leadership and the participating president's collaboration. Gustavo became the founding facilitator or chair of WCAA, and one year later, I became the second. Now WCAA has its eighth chairperson from Kenya, Professor Isaac Nyamongo. WCAA's membership has grown from the original 14 to 56 associations of all over the world, covering most of anthropological associations of import. During this process of the development of WCAA, Gustavo made a tremendous contributions to WCAA and world anthropology in various ways. But I'd like to particularly emphasize one of his creations, Deja Vu. As many of you should know, Deja Vu is an open access online journal, which is a collection of the year's representative articles published by each of member association of WCAA. Already published. So this online multilingual journal is titled Deja Vu, or Already Read. Already read, but thus collected together, it is an eye-opening. This journal is certainly changing the landscape and the projects of the world see, and it is providing a dynamic flow of information, knowledge, and outcomes in heterodox discourses in different in the differing world anthropologies. In 2009, when the 16th World Anthropology Congress of IUAS was held in Kunming, China, Gustavo was elected to be vice president of IUAS, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences and served in that capacity for nine years until 2018. In the same year, 2009, I was elected to be Secretary General of IUAS, and I have been with IUAS ever since. Working closely with Gustavo and other executives of IUAS, we we wrote the constitution of IUAS in 2012 for bringing about democracy and for increasing the possibility of further development of IUAS. At the 17th World Anthropology Congress in Manchester in 2013, four years later, WCA and IUAS started to discuss closer more intensive and wider collaboration between the two international organizations. The effort culminated in the voting for the integration of WCAA and IUAS into a new bicameral organization named WOW, the World Anthropological Union. The WOW constitution was drafted and adopted in November 2017. WOW started to function as an organization at the 18th World Anthropology Congress in Florianopolis, Brazil. The new organization, WOW, is composed of IUS Chamber and WCA Chamber. WCA Chamber Gustavo created holds biennial meetings of delegates of member associations, organizes panels and workshops on the topics of global concern, 
published, uh, published the journal, that journal, Deja Vu, conducts a global survey of anthropological practice, organizes a series of webinars, organizes task forces on ethics and other topics, and so on. It is a network of the presidents of anthropological associations over the world. Gustavo and I often talked about power, particularly political power, and we always agreed that power is necessary and important if it is used for a good cause. I understand that Gustavo gathered the presidents of associations to Recife in 2004 because they were at the top of respective association and they have access to executive power for making a relevant decision and taking a necessary action. Now this WCAA joined WOW together with IUAS to which Gustavo served for nine years as vice president. This means that WOW is given now an exceptionally strong political base on the resources of the two characteristic chambers. WCAA is an association of associations with a broad network of the presidents. And IUAS is an association of individual anthropologists with the aim of holding global and rotating congresses. Both chambers are working for the same objective to move towards an anthropology of anthropologies. By creating a synergy of the resources coming from the two different but complementary chambers, and by intensifying a collaboration between IUAS and the WCAA, we will be able to do things hitherto impossible for anthropology and beyond. Some final words. In our personal communication about a year ago, Gustavo and I were talking about the WCAA he created. He was talking about the achievements we have had with WCAA and other international, internationalization initiatives, as well as his own frustration and a kind of discontent with those achievements. Then he remarked as follows, and I'm quoting this with his permission. I, uh, this is Gustavo, I see critic as a way of improving things, of things out of our usual boxes and not of destroying or paralyzing anything. We need to be first ones, we need to be first ones to critique our own activities in order to go further in what we do. Self-congratulatory assessments are good to make us feel powerful and important, but critic is what will show us what to do next." Close quote. This, I think, is a succinct way to put what Gustavo has been doing. Critic as a way of improving things and of thinking out of our usual boxes. And he is going to be the first one to critic his own activities, which we are celebrating here in order to go further in what he does. He's always looking forward to do something new and different. He envisioned pluralized anthropology composed of a multiplicity of world anthropologies, the world system of intellectual production and metropolitan provincialism together with provincial cosmopolitanism. These are visions he offered us, and we now see what we could not see in the 1990s, as I pointed out. I therefore would like to call him a visionary, visionary, 
but this word is not mine. I borrowed it from Bela Feldman Bianco, who characterized him as a visionary in a private conversation several years ago. I vividly remember this word, which Bella used in passing, and I got her permission to mention this at this occasion. Bella says she does not remember she used that word, but I firmly believe that Gustavo is a visionary. I hope he goes further in what he has been doing, engaging in self-critic of what he has he has done. Despite that, we are all here to pay tribute to what he has done. I'm sure he will go further and achieve much more for world anthropologies, strengthening the international organizations and effectiveness of the anthropological profession. Gustavo, because this is a virtual ceremony, I cannot have a physical way to congratulate you adequately. So, yote uh, doi, a grand abrazo. Que lindo. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you so much, my friend. These were Thank lovely you. words. I really enjoyed every one of them. And Thank you. I'm so glad that our, our friendship since uh, 2004 has been so productive. And I always, I also learned a lot with you uh, on patience, on the exact, uh, move, exact moment uh, to move, and on how to put together uh, different uh, opinions. So. I, I, I can say that I am also a great admirer of you and your work uh, on the global and you know, on the Japanese scene. But I know you're also a, a big leader in Japan. Thank you uh, for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Junji, for sharing this important and far-reaching contribution of Gustavo to integrate the World Anthropological Union. And as you mentioned, he's always looking forward. He's really a visionary. Mm -hmm. And uh, last but not least, we give the floor in this homage to Rosana Guber. She's an Argentine social anthropologist with a degree at the University of Buenos Aires and a PhD at John, Johns Hopkins University. She is senior researcher at the Argentine Council of Scientific and Technological Research and leads the master's in social anthropology at the National University of San Martin. Her research deals with ethnographic fieldwork, social anthropology of Argentine uh, uh, warriors experience at the Malvinas Falklands war between Argentina and Great Britain in 1982. She published several books such as Ethnografía, Método Campo y Reflexibilidad, very much cited in Mexico, El Salvaje Metropolitano, La Articulación Etnográfica, De Chicos a Veteranos, Experiencia de Halcón. She has uh, awarded the Platinum Call Next Prize in Archaeology, Anthropology. So we give the floor to Rosana. Adelante, Rosana. Gracias, Carmen. Thank you to all. And um, well, it is my pleasure and my honor to take part of this homage to a global human being and a global anthropologist of the global in such a global event as IUAS. And certainly in a global situation, I can't remember who said this, but someone said that in our global world, there are four kinds of countries or nations, the developed ones, the underdeveloped ones, Japan and Argentina. Japan is an archipelago with little land to cultivate and has recovered from two wars and quite successful at that. Argentina is a big food producer 
had a very short war, but has underdeveloped itself. So let me speak from the Argentine side of this global setting. And since I've never renounced to generalizations, let me ask once again, who is Gustavo Lins Ribeiro? I'll try to give a short answer after um, Junji's answer that he's a visionary or Junji and uh, Bela's answer. I met him in 1985 at Esther Hermites' house in Buenos Aires. Esther was the first social anthropologist in Argentina. She graduated in Chicago and worked in the Chiapas Highlands for her PhD. Gustavo was introduced to Esther by another US graduate in social anthropology who studied at Madison, Wisconsin. He was Leopoldo Bartolomé. Leopoldo was sent, almost sent by Esther to Madison to get a PhD, then to come back to his country and do social anthropology here. Of course he did and uh, created the first degree in social anthropology in Argentina, but he did not do that in Buenos Aires where the capital city of Argentina where everything happens, but in the northeastern province of Misiones. Leopoldo was the head of the social team of the binational entity Jacereta, devoted to build a dam in Paraguayan and Argentine waters of the Paraná River. The anthropological team had to manage the relocation of the poor people who lived on the riverbanks. So this Brazilian graduate student called Gustavo came from CUNY to do his PhD dissertation, or at least fieldwork, on Jacireta. He was one of Eric Wolf's disciples, and this fact said very much about that promising dissertation. So there he went, commuting back and forth between Jacireta, close to Itusengo city, Posadas, and Buenos Aires. When, when did all this happen? Was 1985. Argentine social sciences, retaking um, Gustavo's point today in this conference, um, Argentine social sciences were recovering from a harsh dictatorship. Brazil had regained democracy, I think, in the late 70s, and uh, Argentina uh, did so in 1983. Uruguay and Chile came later. So sociologists and political scientists returned from exile, but few anthropologists did so. We, native and young anthropologists, were very enthusiastic in creating social anthropology and renew anthropology altogether here in Argentina. One of our new principles was that anthropology was not just about Indian people, aboriginals, aborigines. It could be about almost everything. And in fact, Gustavo was bringing new social subjects to our field, the bichos de obra, Bicho de Obra were the engineers who were experts on dams. Although most of us could not read Gustavo's thesis until several years later, we sensed that this Brazilian graduate student from CUNY was opening new paths. Jacireta was huge and was binational. The Brazilian government had already finished the Itaipu Dam, and now Gustavo was welcomed by Bartolome, even though some state agents in Argentina were complaining about this potential spy from Brazil snooping in this new Paraguayan Argentine venture. But Leopoldo was his host and kindly opened several gates to him. Gustavo was not working with relocations as most anthropologists in Misiones did. He was working on state companies and the national state. At that time, this was a completely new subject, a study upturn which Argentine anthropology seldom followed up. With some exceptions, the state, one of the keys 
of the Argentine fate was remain, has remained largely overlooked by us Argentine anthropologists. My other recollection of those days was Gustavo's paper, Decodidianizar. Decodidianizar was something like defamiliarize, but it's not quite the same, uh, which he published uh, on the brand new Cuadernos de Antropología Social, Social Anthropology uh, Notebooks of the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Buenos Aires. What impacted me the most about that paper was that he was focusing on all of us, on anthropologists doing anthropology. He was saying at that time that we were doing anthropology in familiar settings, which had to be defamiliarized. All this made Gustavo a reliable colleague to me, especially when ideas, ideals, and utopias blossomed everywhere in the southern cone of Latin America. As soon as Gustavo suggested I go to the US for a PhD, I paid attention. And when he recommended Johns Hopkins, where Wolf's brother, Sidney Mintz, was teaching, there I went to study a binational war from the Argentine Armed Forces perspective. As I say all this, I gather that Gustavo was doing with me and probably many others what other anthropologists have done uh, throughout the 20th century to cultivate a certain kind of anthropology in other countries. Because of all this, I was not surprised at all when he ended up thinking and writing about world unequal anthropologies, power, as Junji said. As Brazilian anthropologist Roberto Cardoso Oliveira once put it, Interethnic strife grows in interethnic friction areas, not in isolation. It was precisely in the 70s that Latin American social sciences, mainly Brazilian social scientists, though exiled, provided the basis for uh, dependence theory, while anthropologists such as Bartolome, Hermite, Arquete, and Cardoso de Oliveira. Rivera worked with the notions of social articulation and cultural or social brokers, which uh, Gustavo mentioned already. It is no surprise that Gustavo and other Latin American colleagues who graduated from metropolitan universities started to think about scholar inequalities in the world system and on how such inequalities have survived until today. To do so, he had to defamiliarize world anthropology and identify world anthropologies. He had to see as exotic the current ways and fluxes in which a global south drinks theory from global north water. Some years ago, I had the following reflection in a Chilean conference. I was inspired by an article which appeared on the Sunday Times published during the Malvinas War, the Malvinas Falcons War in 1982. It was written by E.P. Thompson, Edward Thompson, the well-known historian of the English working class and at that time an anti-nuclear activist. He said that it's true the Argentine government is made of butchers and torturers and that human rights are systematically violated by the juntas. But let's look at who sells them weapons, he warned. The global north, of course. I thought that for that conference at the brand new Master of Latin American Anthropology at the Alberto Hurtado University in Santiago de Chile, I could share a puzzle. As I said in that lecture, Southern anthropologists used to buy theory where our governments used to buy weapons. Quite a statement which has always been overlooked by the self-appointed critical and reflexive discipline, anthropology. The polarization between North Atlantic and the rest of the world 
may have changed since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union. This AAA prize, to Gustavo Lins Ribeiro, is bestowed to someone who knows the North Atlantic anthropology extremely well, but who has remained tied to the South. Is this a promising turn to a global anthropology in a new era? This edition of the Franz Boas Prize reminds me of another one, the award of the John Desmond Bernal Prize of the 4S, Society of Social Studies of Science, to anthropologist Ebe Vesuri in 2017. She was the first scholar who did not come from the North Atlantic to get this distinction. North Atlantic, not Europe, not US. When I started this short speech, I asked who is Gustavo Lins Ribeiro? I've just heard Shunji say with Bio Bella Benfelban Bianco that Gustavo is a visionary. I'd rather look for a word of the anthropological's huge treasure. And I would dare say prophetism. A prophet is someone who envisages a new world but belongs to the old one. His words are hard to understand at the beginning. They look exotic, mysterious. When the new world finally arrives, everything looks like it was going to be that way. The prophet's words become trivial and his speech becomes ordinary talk. Prophets do not predict reality. They define that part of reality they have just discovered. Prophets are hardworking beings. They never leave us behind. They leave, but they also return. They never forget us. They open paths and they interpret scholarly relations in a generous, creative and multifarious way. They learn and they teach all the time. They never arrive. They never stay still. They're always exploring new horizons and show them to us and also discuss them with us. They are always in the making while they push further the boundaries of our global discipline to the outside, to the secular world, and to the inside, within the sacred principles of our discipline. And in so doing, they forge a less ethnocentric or rather less Eurocentric discipline and turn it into what Marisa Peirano um, once said, a more genuinely plural and universal anthropology for us all and for all. Gustavo Liz Ribeiro deserves to be the new owner of this global prize, probably because he contributed to name, to acknowledge important political and theoretical notions, such as world anthropologies, the One Ram Network, post-imperialism, and many other etc. Et we live by and we think through. He did so from Latin America and from the world at the same time. But new challenges wait for him and for us in the anthropological world. What happened to our colleague Ashraf Ghani, my professor at Johns Hopkins, where you sent me, and to global anthropologies after the Taliban turn in Afghanistan? What happens now with the military turn of some ethnic movements in Latin America? And also what happens and what will happen to the peaceful Aboriginal people who have never stopped to be exploited and marginalized by civilians and the military, by governments of the right and of the left? In sum, what will ethnicity mean in the 20th century? Prophet Gustavo, let's talk about this in your next prize. And thank you so much for inviting me to this event. Thank you, uh, Rosanna. <laughs> I, 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 I find it um, amazing that you call me a prophet. I feel like I have long beard and, and, and perhaps a, a white vest walking on the sands. <laughs> 
but dear uh, uh, Rosna, uh, I uh, it's it's really amazing that uh, we're going to be it's going to be forty years that we know each other and uh, that we have been to so many different cafes in in, in Buenos Aires discussing all kinds of uh, of issues uh, in terms of anthropology, social sciences, politics, you name it. And uh, that uh, when we were graduate students, we didn't know where we were going. <laughs> you never know. You just wish that everything goes well. And I'm so proud of what you have done. Uh, you completely right. Your generation of uh, Argentinian anthropologists have built an entirely new and brilliant body of professionals, of intellectuals that have a great contribution, not only to the knowledge about your country, but to the knowledge of the world and to the politics uh, of uh, a great uh, Latin American uh, country. Um, yes. I'm, I'm, I, I, I am inclined to be a uh, bicho de obra myself, or, my, uh, or, or better saying a bicho academico, <laughs> uh, but also I'm proud to be Latin American, I'm proud to be Brazilian, and I'm proud to have lived in, in Argentina and have so many uh, wonderful friends like you, and, and to live in Mexico. Yes, I talk from Latin America. And thank you so much for your so uh, kind words and extremely generous vision uh, of myself. I'm really moved by what you and Juji said. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, for pointing out Gustavo's refreshing topics, and he's an explorer, as you mentioned to defamiliarize the vision and the scope of anthropology in a plural and at the same time universal world, the world that we are give, living in this 21st century. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. And as you can see, Gustavo, this award fills us with great pride. We are very, very proud of you. And enhorabuena y muchísimas gracias. Thank you all, it was wonderful, I'll never forget it. <laughs>Yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much for your interventions. Thank you very much, uh, Gustavo, for your participation and for your prize. And yes. I think uh, it is important your participation because you show the, uh, the importance of dialogue and discussion to make the, the anthropology grow. That's the only way to share ideas and to discuss ideas. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. So good to see you. Hope to see you, to meet you in person sometime and hug you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.